Hey everybody, this is Dr. Lori Shemek. And I'm Omar Cumberbatch. You're listening to This Podcast Burns Fat. Hey Lori, how are you today? I'm doing great, Omar. How's everything on your end? Fantastic. No complaints yeah. on this end. Yeah, no, all good. All right. So happy to hear that. Same here. Good, good. Um, uh, so today I'm really excited to share. We have Dr. Grayson Wickham and he is a doctor of physical therapy and he was great. I mm-hmm. mean, he really did a wonderful job and opened my eyes about quite a few things. Um, some, you know, myths that we all believe about stretching and some other things. And, you know, uh, one thing I love that he talks about is, uh, you know, how our back pain is not caused by genetics. A lot of people mm-hmm. believe it is, and um, that's one thing he hears over and over again. <laughs> you know yeah. how people complain, "Oh, it's, it runs in my family," and uh, the mm-hmm. you know the endless list. But um, yeah, he was fantastic, and you guys will learn a lot. Yeah, no, it was really a great show. He dropped a lot of knowledge, like you mentioned. And one of the things that I got from it for sure was the fact that at the end of the day, we're trying to exercise, lose weight, and it's not fun trying to push through pain. And there Mm -hmm. is a way around that. And he really jumps into just some just practical tips on how to get that moving as well. So I think the audience is going to love this one. I do too. All right, let's jump into it. Okay. Hey, Dr. Grayson, welcome to the show. How are you today? Hey, doing great. Uh, Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dr. Grayson, for being here. You uh, are going to add value for sure to people's lives today. So thank you. And, you know, we all have aches and pains and we all are getting older, um, but we really don't have to uh, get old the way we all think about age, right? Aging. So um, I would love for you just to give us a little bit about your background and, um, and what you primarily, what your message is for people. Yeah, you're right on the head there with, uh, you know, we don't, we our, our joints don't have to feel like we're 60 or 40. Um, you know, as long as we're doing joint maintenance in the mm-hmm. form of a, an effective stretching uh, um, routine. So yeah, I'm Dr. Grayson Wickham. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, um, had a, my own practice for years now, have kind of worked with everyone, literally everyone from <laughs> professional athletes, MLB, NFL players, all the way, you know, to someone that's never worked out in their life and, you know, hates the thought of exercise. And so everyone in between all ages, all fitness levels. And um, I'm also founder of the Movement Vault stretching app. Um, We can dive into that a little bit. But Mm -hmm. essentially, you know, through my practice, you know, I've I've kind of been aware of different uh, patterns. um, And what I've seen, and this is not a new revelation, but uh, unfortunately, the way most people are living today, Uh, We're sitting way too much and we're not getting in in enough varied movement. And so what that leads to is tight muscles and tight joints. Um, It doesn't lead to that overnight per se. And you won't even become, you know, say stuck, you know, in a rounded hunched over position in a week or even a month. But one thing I like to, you know, teach people is that our body conforms to the positions that we spend the most time in. And so if we're, you know, hunched over at our desk or bent over our phone, uh, for, you know, say X amount of hours a day, you times that by years or decades. Well, eventually you do literally start to become that position with the rounded upper back. Wow. And yeah. And so essentially, you know, I saw that most pain and injury, uh, is just due to tight muscles and tight joints again, due to sitting too much lack of movement. And so then the question is like, how do we fix that problem? And yeah, we can, um, you know, we can get standing desk. We can do some type of ergonomics that, definitely helps, but implementing an effective stretching routine, specifically active stretching is really the way to undo some of these, um, you know, these changes that are happening from lack of movement and sitting. And so that's been my, my primary uh, driving force over the last years. Yeah, so Dr. Grace, you brought up a lot of uh, nuggets over there. I, I just think of myself as a caveman. I remember just growing up and we never stretched. <laughs> like we could go on a basketball <laughs> court, play, we lift weights, right away how prevalent do you think that is in society today and is it just really something that like i I give to the male uh, ego that we don't really take it in consideration how important this stretching is in everyday life 
Yeah, unfortunately, I do see a lot of people that unfortunately don't stretch, you know, for various reasons, maybe they they don't understand the importance of it, or maybe they feel like they don't have the time to do it. And, um, you know, the analogy that I like to make is an effective stretching routine is essentially joint maintenance, uh, just like brushing our teeth is teeth maintenance. And, you know, most people hopefully obviously uh, brush their teeth, they can find <laughs> the time, they can find the time to brush their teeth. Um, and they get that if they don't brush their teeth, we're probably going to get cavities, you know, teeth will rot and, you know, good things, bad things will happen. And so, you know, you that's, like the tutors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And so, um, it's, it's the same analogy, you know, we need to maintain our joints and again, cause we're sitting too much, we're not moving enough. We, we develop these tight muscles and tight joints, which then leads to all types of other problems down the line. Like you mentioned, uh, with aging. So yeah, some people just aren't stretching period. Um, and so my, my kind of goal, um, is to inform them on the importance of stretching and, and really it's a non-negotiable if we want to age correctly have good joint longevity as well as perform at our best whether that's in our daily activities or we play a sport or we have you know we work out etc um, and then the other kind of piece there is there are lots of people that do stretch but unfortunately i do see the majority of people, whether I'm, you know, working with them or have worked with them one-on-one, -on -one, or I'm just observing from afar at the gym uh, before a sporting event, I even see professional athletes all the time. They're doing what's called static stretching. Now, static stretching is where you would, it's, it's probably what most listeners unfortunately are doing. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. It's where you, it's where you stretch out a muscle or a joint, and then you just relax into that hold. Um, yeah, I do that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so the, so the question is like, you know, why do, why is static stretching bad? So when, when we look at the research, static stretching has actually shown to increase injury risk and decrease performance. So I, I always repeat that for no wonder. everyone. <laughs> yeah. Right. I always repeat that. So it's like static stretching. Again, this is based off, you know, studies and research has been shown to increase injury risk and decrease performance. But then if, you know, if I would ask you, Lori, so you're static stretching, mm -hmm. um, First of all, why do you stretch? I stretch because uh, I follow you. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I know it's it's important for our muscle health. I you know I never equated it to joint health though until I saw your talking points, and um, but for muscle, I guess um, flexibility is the word. Mm. Okay, yeah, and that's that's the same thing that. I I hear from a lot of people, you know, that mm -hmm. do take the time out to stretch. I, I was asked them, um, you know, what are your goals with stretching? And a lot of times they say, you know, to improve my, my flexibility, maybe they'll say to improve my joint mobility, mm -hmm. to warm up before workouts or exercises. Um, and so, you know, then I unfortunately have to drop the, the bad news that, you know, they're, they're static stretching and, you know, doing static stretching specifically before a workout or an exercise is can be actually detrimental yeah. because you can, you know, increase injury risk, decrease performance. So you're actually better not, you know, Omar, in your case, um, you are actually better off not static stretching before your workouts than to actually static stretch and do it. So the, then the question is, what do you need to be doing? And that's active stretching. Yeah. yeah so and I want to, I think it's important to note too, is I was always told that that's dangerous, that it, it's your potentially going to injure yourself with the, the non-static stretching. Yeah, that's, that's totally false, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I guess for the listeners, what's, you know, we kind of talked about static stretching is that stretching out or a muscle or a joint. So if you were to, you know, be sitting on the ground, you had your legs out in front of you, you bent down to, you know, reach for your toes, the classic um, kind of hamstring stretch, or maybe you're standing mm -hmm. up and reaching down again, these are examples of static stretching. And so the difference between that and active stretching is with active stretching, we're first going to stretch out the muscle or the joint, and then we're going to actively contract those muscles while they're maximally stretched out. So that involves actually contracting those same muscles that you're stretching out. And then we would hold that contraction, not just relaxing into the stretch, like a static stretch, but actually maintaining what's called an isometric contraction while your muscles are are maximally stretched 
And that wow. that's going to have, it's got so many different benefits from, you know, it is the most effective way to improve flexibility and mobility, but you're also getting stronger in your joints and range position. You're improving your joint stability. You're improving your muscle activation uh, via what's called proprioception, which is just a fancy word for saying body awareness. And mm-hmm. you're also improving your balance and and the list goes on. So yeah, unfortunately, the um, you know whoever told you that active stretching is 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 not good is uh, unfortunately mis- misinformed and right. Yeah, and so f- since I've heard that, I haven't done that, you know. But I know I see. I used to see a lot of people do the active stretching, you know, well the bouncing. Maybe that's that. Maybe that's a point that needs to be clarified. So I was told not to bounce when you stretch. If you're going to stretch, do it smoothly, gently hold the stretch and, but do not move, you know, bounce while you're doing it. Yeah, that's a great clarifying uh, point. So that would be more termed as ballistic stretching. So that's kind of like where you're forcefully, it's basically like a, a static stretch where you go to your, your end range or your, your flexibility mm-hmm. limits. And then, like you said, you kind of bounce, you kind of like push yourself a little bit further back and forth in a ballistic manner. That's why they call it ballistic mm-hmm. stretching. Wow. Totally different, actually, than, um, you know, what's what's called active stretching. Um, Active stretching is actually, you know, if we got like super scientific with it or, you know, nerdy with it, it's a end range of motion isometric contraction. Um, So, yeah, definitely different. Um, I'm not a fan of ballistic stretching either. So I guess whoever (laughs) whoever told you that was (laughs) was actually right. So, yeah, definitely. And then there's actually dynamic stretching, too. It's like it gets confusing with all these semantics like static stretching. Then you have ballistic stretching. Then you have dynamic stretching. Dynamic stretching is more so like if you were to do some almost think about like a dynamic warm up. You see people doing Mm -hmm. like leg swings, um, like skipping movement, high knees um butt kicks and do you like those yeah i like i like dynamic um mm-hmm. movements and stretching um if it's incorporated well so that will never replace active stretching per se but if we if we do some active stretching and then we want to you know do a few minutes more of some dynamic you know kind of more explosive movements again that's different than ballistic um that will actually prepare you for you know if you're you're going to be playing a sport basketball Etc. or a workout. Um, I, I like that. So doc, I know that, um, a lot of this stuff, I guess like the static stretches, it's basically just outdated information that we've been doing for, for a while. And I guess, you know, it's very hard to get rid of some of, some of those things, but I'm just curious if, uh, another outdated concept is, is lifting weights actually making you less flexible because we we do Good question do, yeah yeah no, very, definitely curious about that mm-hmm. yeah um the answer is yes and no <laughs> so it, <laughs> it it really comes down to that principle where you know the the human body is just amazing right whether it's diet or you know these little stressors that we put on our body whether going in the sauna um ice ice plunges um our body adapts to these stressors and stimuluses and things that we put at it just kind of like we talked about with your body conforming to the positions that you spend the most time in um and so if you are you know say say working out lifting weights um you know you're following a certain program uh you're getting hopefully stronger um and or building some type of muscle um if you are only performing exercises through a partial range of motion and you're that's kind of like what you do all the time then mm-hmm. yes actually lifting weights could um and usually does actually um make you more tight make your joints more tight your muscles more tight because you're only using them through a limited range of motion and you're doing that consistently so if you did it say you had a workout and you just for whatever reason you wanted to do just partial range of motion uh, exercise. So an example of that would be to say like if, if you were doing a push up. so full range would be with your elbows fully extended and then literally uh, bringing your chest pretty close to the ground. Now this all depends on your current mobility level. level. You wouldn't want to push past your, your limits of your shoulder because then you know, you're going to potentially cause injury. But you always want to use your full range of motion on that given day. Um, just to again maintain your range of motion but say for whatever reason you just did a partial range you just went down you know kind of like the 
the mini push-ups you see a lot of people doing, um, that would be a partial range of motion. And same thing for like, say like a pull-up. If you just, if you didn't start every rep of your pull-up from a, a relatively full hang and then pull all the way up so that your chin is, you know, over the bar, that would be a, a full range of motion, um, you know, exercise. And it, and if you're, if you're performing the full range of motion exercise, you're, you're consistently using your joints and your muscles through a full range of motion. And you're much more uh, liable to maintain and sometimes even improve your mobility and your flexibility and your joint stability to a certain extent versus if you were just to say do partial range of motion, like, you know, you, you can apply that to anything, whether it's an overhead press or a squat or a lunge. Um, I always recommend people try to use their full available range of motion um, with every exercise, every rep, mm -hmm. and that's going to really maintain your active joint mobility. You are an, an inspiring example of, fit, of fitness. Um, it's amazing to see images of you doing these, some of these exercises. Um, so, it, you know, I just commend you for taking, you know, being a great leader, great teacher. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you say that your knee pain isn't your knee's fault and that joint replacement surgery is 98% preventable. And why is that? Yeah. First, first off, I, I appreciate that. I'm blushing over here. <laughs> uh, we have to, uh, we have to practice what we preach and, um, you know, yes. I, I definitely try to do that as much as possible as I know you guys do. Right. Um, and yeah, so two different things there. So when we, when we think about the knee and even the elbow for that example, um, but we'll talk about the knee just cause it's more common. A lot of people have knee pain. And when we think of, when we look at the, the movements of the knee, the main movement is to essentially bend and straighten your, your knee. Uh, it's mm -hmm. got a little bit of rotation when your knees bent, but primarily it shouldn't be rotating a whole lot. Um, and so obviously the joint above it is your hip. And if your hip is tight and, or isn't stable, um, and you're trying to perform a certain movement, whether that's an exercise in the gym or you're running or you're walking, doing life activities, it really doesn't matter. But say you have a tight hip um, or a hip that doesn't have good mobility, well, then there's gonna be a joint close by that has to compensate for that lack of movement at the hip. And in this case, it's, it's almost always the knee. It's either the knee or the low back and or both. And so when it comes to knee pain- With the, the uh, sorry to interrupt. You mean with the hip not being um, strong? Yeah. So it could be two things. It could be that the hip is actually physically tight. Um, so people would, you know, the analogy would be you're, you're not very flexible there, but the more, I guess, correct term would be, you just don't have good hip mobility. Mm -hmm, um, okay. So your range of motion isn't, isn't great. And, or maybe you just don't have good stability in the hip. Maybe you are what's called hypermobile or hyperflexible, and you have sometimes freakish amounts of flexibility at your hip but you just don't have good control of that hip. So you're, you know, whether that's actually just a strength issue with all the, the muscles that surround the hip or more of a activation issue, um, muscle activation issue that's causing the, essentially the hip to, you're, you're not controlling your hip well, that's going to essentially lead to, you know, what's termed as like a sloppy hip. You know, you can't, you can't really control your hip. So then all of a sudden your knee um, is put in positions that really it wasn't designed to be in. Um, now your body can get away with that for a long time, whether that is a, a tight hip or an unstable hip, but after, you know, over time, whether you're running or bending down to pick something up or gardening, cleaning your house, it doesn't matter. Um, that's going to cause joint wear and tear in your meniscus and the cartilage of your knee. And over time, that little bit of compensation because your hip is tight is going to eventually break down, um, you know, essentially your joint, the tissues in your joint. And that's going to lead to pain, um, you know, injury. And then over the years, if you don't fix the root cause, and we always looking for the root cause, the root cause mm -hmm. in this case, this example is your tight hip. We need to, you know, work on active stretching for that hip. Um, that can lead to uh, knee replacement. And a lot of times it does, unfortunately. And um, yeah, that's, that's the thing I like to say that uh, essentially most joint replacements are hundred percent preventable. Like yeah. joint, joint replacements shouldn't exist for the most part outside yeah. of 
really severe genetic predisposition, which is way more rare than people think they, you know, they think, oh, I've got this, these genetics, my dad's got bad knees and my brother's got bad knees. So I'm going to have bad knees. And then I say, well, how is your brother living? How's your dad living? You know, are they sitting all day? Are they, you know, are they doing joint maintenance? Again, are they doing an active uh, stretching um, effective program? And usually the answer is no. Well, well, yeah, you're going to have, if you have, if you're living the same way as your brother and your uncle or whoever it is, then you probably will have knee pain. Um, it's like diet, <laughs> metabolic health, you know, it runs in the family. Yeah, exactly. Right. Or doesn't run. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, so I've heard that knee pain, uh, knee, sorry, uh, knee replacement surgery is overdone that doctors are doing it for when they really don't have to do it as well. So is this, is this something that we could possibly, you say it's preventable, maybe do some, uh, exercises to keep us from getting a joint, a new joint there. Oh, 100%. Yeah. If we, if you can essentially maintain at least a certain level of hip, really just hip mobility, ankle mobility, when it, if we're talking about the knee, uh, specifically, mm -hmm. because if you either have a tight ankle or a tight hip, then your knee's going to, again, compensate. It's going to do those little adjustments, those rotations that's going to cause the wear and tear. And so if you are doing, you know, again, going back to the brushing your teeth, if you're brushing your teeth every day, you're not going to have those cavities, right? Or, you, mm -hmm. you know, at least decrease the, the chances significantly. If you're maintaining your, your range of motion and you're doing effective stretches, um, you know, at least I, I like to say three times a week. Um, at the minimum, um, doesn't have to be for an hour, 10 to 15 minutes, as long as you're doing effective stretches, um, then yeah, you, you will totally prevent, uh, for the most part, uh, you know, any type of knee surgery, knee replacements. And yeah, just like you said, it's, you know, whether people are getting, um, unfortunately, I would say poor advice from a surgeon, mm -hmm. um, or it's just their lack of patience, you know, it's like, okay, they've, they've kind of fit this, the patterns that unfortunately a lot of people are living in, you know, sitting too much, all the things we said, and now they have knee pain. Now it's inevitable. Yeah. Now it's an inevitable. Now they're just in a rush. You know, they've, right. they've been dealing with the knee pain for so long because people, it's not like the first time they get the pain, they run to the doctor. It's, they've been dealing with it for five years, you know, three years. And this is a chronic overuse thing that's been creeping up over these years. And by the time they go there, you know, maybe they even tried physical therapy, you know, for six weeks. And I hear this all the time, uh, I tried physical therapy, you know, six weeks, it didn't help much. And then, you know, boom, they're getting, you know, their knee replaced or knee surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and why you know, didn't it, it help physical therapy? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, I just like to be straightforward with people, you know, just like whether you're a health coach, nutritionist, a lawyer, you know, there's different levels of, you know, someone's passion, someone's skill set, the amount of time studying that they've done in their profession. And just like a surgeon, just like a physical therapist, you know, there's, there's different levels. There's some that are amazing. There's some that are pretty good. And unfortunately there's some that aren't that great. Um, and then when you couple, um, you know, some, some insurance politics in there and, you know, trying to make money as an overhead, as a physical therapy clinic, I'm not making any excuses. Yeah, I know. Um, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, these what we call uh, PT factories come in, yes. and it's it's basically just pumping people in and out. And um, this will be actually a, a nice tip for the listeners. Uh, so if somebody comes to me and they say, "Yeah, I've tried physical therapy, you know, for six eight weeks," and then you know my follow up is, "Okay, so what did you do during those six and eight weeks?" Well, you know, I went into the clinic. They put you know heat or ice on my knee, and then I got some ultrasound or I got some e stim, and then they had me with this sheet of stretches kind of in the corner, um, <laughs> you know, and I was like, you know, there was a, a trainer that was kind of watching me. I'm yeah. like, yeah, unfortunately that's, it gives physical therapy a bad name. And I really don't even consider that physical therapy. Um, you know, those are all red flags. So if you, if you're going to a place and you're getting ice or heat or you're getting, you know, ultrasound, those, those things are not very effective ice and heat. You can do that at yourself, you know, yeah. at your home. Mm -hmm. And, exactly. um, the clinic's basically charging for that, um, charging insurance. A lot. For that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, unfortunately, you know, th there are obviously people that go to a legit skilled physical therapist, um, whether they, 
you know, some, some, sometimes surgery is needed, you know, I'm not saying all surgery mm -hmm. is never needed, but, um, yeah, unfortunately, like you said, surgeries are often done way too often. And another piece in there too, is the MRI machine. So a lot of times people, they'll get an MRI of their knee or their back, and it'll show this thing. And all of a sudden now someone has a diagnosis and they're really set on, you know, fixing that diagnosis, um, that the MRI showed. But, you know, if we look at studies and even like low back pain, for instance, you know, if you, if you do an MRI on a huge sample of the population, 60% of the population is going to have a bulging disc and or herniated disc. That's so, exactly true. I've, I've read that before that the majority of people, if you're aging, you have degenerative disc disease generally. Yeah, hundred percent. And and so if we just went off the MRI machine, then 60% of those people would be getting surgeries. But then if you, you know, actually how many of those 60% actually have symptoms, it's, you know, less than 10%, right. kind of, kind of around 10%. So yeah, I always, interesting. yeah. I mean, unfortunately, you know, people are in a rush to get results and, you know, sometimes they're pushed into surgery too often. And sometimes surgery can, um, can be a game changer, but sometimes it can really, not even help that much. And sometimes you actually, uh, you feel worse afterwards. So um, I'm all about getting to the root cause and preventing these things. And even if you do have pain or injury, we can still fix the root cause. Um, and then again, that just comes down to ensuring that your joints move the way that they should move, which then decreases the compensation in the other joints. So Dr. Grace, okay. how do you assess like these insufficiencies? I mean, we're, we're talking total body when someone comes and say they don't even have pain and they want to be a proactive in preventing something like that? How do you like assess what the insufficiencies are? Yeah. So um, if somebody is coming in physically to see me and or so two different, two different um, categories here. So either way, I'm going to take them through some type of mobility assessment. So I want to assess at least globally how their body and how their joints are moving to see if they have adequate range of motion and you know have the ability to you know contract muscles in certain areas um, and that can be done in a you know 10 to 14 step test um, like in the movement fault app we have a virtual mobility assessment where it's essentially a a 14 step test just like i would do in the clinic with somebody and after somebody goes through that 14 steps the app actually creates a total mobility score so that'll give you um, kind of like an overall score for your total mobility. And then we actually break that down into the five or six major joints in the body. And then you'll get a score for that. So that'll help you figure out, okay, my hips are a little tighter. My upper back's a little tighter. Maybe my ankles are tighter. I'll focus on that more. And then same thing, you know, if I'm working in the clinic with somebody, I'm going to see how they're able to move their shoulder in specific uh, ranges of motion, basically like tests just like in the app and then based on what i see if they if their shoulders are are uh, moving great they have good range of motion again this is active range of motion um, so they're actually the ones moving it i'm not physically moving it uh, for them um, then once we go through the whole test you know that'll give me some data and that will point out okay um, you know your hips are a little tight let's do this active stretch let's do this muscle activation exercise for the hips um, and then obviously focusing on what they need, um, for their, their current situation. That's fantastic. That's really excellent. Yeah. I love that. Um, and you know, and I think it's really important that we do it habitually, you know, like you said, three times a week, 15 minutes. It makes me, it reminds me of that podcast. I listened to Dr. Andrew Huberman. Did, did you have a chance to listen to that on stretching? Yeah, it's a great, yeah, it's a great podcast. Uh, overall, yeah. I got yeah. a few, 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 um, you know, disagreements with his, uh, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately he yeah. dove, dove into a little bit too much on uh, static stretching, but, uh, maybe See? I'll, I'll, <laughs> that's I'll, where I'm getting I'll, my information. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm, overall. I mean, yeah, the podcast yeah. is great. He's great. His information yeah. is amazing. Yeah. Um, just a few points on that podcast that, you know, maybe we'll, um, That's exactly it, because I remember him saying something like, you know, uh, you don't have to stretch a lot, you know, just make sure it's like 15 minutes, three times a week. And it's very something like that. So yeah. I think that's very doable. Um, I just have a question before we wrap, I would love to know what your top 
five stretches are active stretches that we should all be doing? Yeah. So again, it's, you know, just because, you know, most people are sitting, um, what's happening is a, we're putting our joints in a shortened position and that's going to lead to tighter, tighter muscles and tighter joints. There Mm -hmm. are some kind of overarching patterns that a lot of people do have nowadays. Um, that includes tight and or weak hip flexors. Um, that includes, uh, tight and or weak hamstrings. Um, so those are two different areas we want to focus on really the entire spine. Um, and really all of the core musculature that surrounds the, uh, you know, the spine, because, you know, your, your core is not just your six pack ab muscles. That's really your, your spinal erectors, what's called your quadratus lumborum, the muscles in your back. Um, and so when we're using the backrest all day, essentially we're taking off the demands from our core and our, our core really doesn't have to work anymore because now the backrest is doing our core's job. And so over again, years and decades, then that's going to lead to core weakness um, and a unstable and unmobile core, which essentially is going to protect your low back. So that's, we would want to target that, um, your entire spine and your core musculature, um, as well as your shoulders. And so really these are all active stretches. Um, do you, should I describe kind of just a quick brief one of each one or yeah, I think just briefly, um, yeah. so that, and, and where can people find, uh, I was going to ask you this, uh, when we, uh, say goodbye, but, um, th- I know that they can find you with, in your app for sure. They can find this information. Yeah. Yeah. So they can, you know, just movementvault.com. So it's movement V A U L T.com or, uh, in the app store as well, movement vault. Um, so yeah, we have all this information in there, whether it's our daily video classes, um, just a, a plethora of information, whether it's a 16 week low back pain program. Um, we've got a 12 week neck pain program, plantar fasciitis program. So we have full length pain and injury programs, as well as our daily, uh, stretching class every day, which is anywhere from wow. 10 to 15 minutes. Um, yeah, it's, uh, and we have 1500 plus other different video classes to follow along with, but, um, but yeah, as far as like, uh, you know, just kind of taking the listeners really quickly through the stretches, mm-hmm. um, so a, a hamstring stretch, right? An example of that would be if you were to put your heel up on a, say a couch or a bench, and then you would kind of um, kick your hips back and reach down towards that hamstring. You see a lot of people doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be an example of a static stretch. And again, we want to turn this into an active stretch. So what we would do there is while that hamstring, your the the muscle on the back of your upper leg is stretched out, then we're actually going to drive our heel down into the couch or the bench or whatever we're putting our our heel on. And that's going to cause the hamstring to contract while it's maximally stretched out. And then we would hold that for uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 seconds, hold that contraction. And then we would repeat that three to four times per leg. So that would be a great one for the the hamstring. Uh, For the hip flexors, a lot of people are doing the kind of classic you know, half kneeling stretch where they're, you know, back knees down, their their front leg is bent and they're kind of just, you know, pushing the hips forward a little bit. Maybe they're mm-hmm. squeezing their glute. Um, and that would be a good starting position. But then if we wanted to actually make that an active stretch, what we would do is we would think about dragging our back knee. Again, listeners have to kind of envision this one, dragging our back knee mm-hmm. on the, um, on the ground, that's going to cause the hip flexor muscle to contract while it's maximally stretched out. And so again, we would hold that for anywhere from 10 to 20 seconds, uh, three to four repetitions per side. Um, for the spine and the core, I like in the, you know, you might be familiar with say like a, a cat cow or a cat camel. Um, mm-hmm. And so the version that I, I like and that we do in movement fall quite a bit is what's called a segmented uh, cat camel. And that would be to focus on one vertebrae at a time, starting at your low back and your hips and thinking about making a wave of motion all the way up through your neck until your entire back is arched. And then as you're doing that, you're squeezing and contracting all the muscles that attach into each individual vertebrae until you're fully arched. And then you're going to reverse that, keeping your entire back still, uh, flexing your, your chin to your chest, and then slowly uh, flexing and bending one vertebrae from your upper back all the way down to your lower back until your um, your entire back is flexed. Uh, so that would be a great one for the for the uh, spine uh, as far as spine health. 
for shoulders, um, you know, because a lot of people have tight muscles in the front of the shoulders, whether it's the pecs, um, pec major, pec minor, you know, a lot of people are doing the classic doorway stretch per se. Right. Again, that's a good position, but again, a static stretch. So um, you can easily turn that one into an active stretch. So what you would do is you would, you know, put your arm in that doorway or that wall and get into the maximal stretch first. And then again, you would contract those muscles that you're stretching out by kind of pulling your arm and driving your arm into the, the wall or the door or whatever it's on. And again, holding that contraction for 10 to 20 minutes. Um, and that would be a solid one uh, for the shoulders. And then uh, lastly, for the ankles, a lot of people don't even think about stretching their ankles or even their feet. Um, I know. And how do you know you have tight ankles? You mentioned that earlier. Do they hurt? Is that <laughs> yeah, a some, symptom? Yeah, some people's uh, ankles do uh, hurt, unfortunately. Um, a bunch of different tests you can do. I, there's a actually in the in the movement fault app, but part of the um, mobility assessment is testing the ankles. And there's a test where you would essentially use a wall and you would have your your leg, you know, at different increments away from the wall, keeping your heel down on the ground, you would translate your knee forward to try to touch the wall. And essentially, we're going to see how far away we can get your oh. the, the front of your foot away from the wall while still touching. And that'll give us mm -hmm. a sense of how tight your calf muscles are. Um, so that's a good way to assess that. And um, an active stretch for the, for the uh, ankles would be, you can even do something extremely basic, like doing the classic calf stretch where someone's hands are on the wall and they have that, um, you know, their back leg back, they've got a nice stretch on their calf. Mm -hmm. Instead of just, you know, holding that and relaxing and, and you know, having that static stretch there, you would actually contract those calf muscles by pushing your foot down on the gas pedal. Uh, that's the cue that I give is, you know, push your foot, put your pushed your foot down on the gas pedal. That's <laughs> Done a tough that one. too. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and then you're essentially doing the same thing that we just discussed, uh, contracting the calf muscles while they're maximally stretched out. So I, I do have one more question because I'm just, I mean, by the way, you're a great uh, describer oh, yeah. because I, I, I know exactly what, <laughs> everything that you're totally talking about. You're talking. <laughs> that was really good. Um, how much of this do we like stretch into, I don't, I don't want to say pain, but how gentle is it? How much do we have to feel it in order to get the most benefit That's a out good of question. it? question. Yeah. Yeah. So I always um, advise people and we talk about this a lot, you know, in the video classes is it, it really depends on what the, what the pain is, right? So if it's some discomfort, just from say a, uh, a stretch in the, let's even take that, that calf um, example, you know, we're, our hands are on the wall, we've got the, the leg back, we're feeling a stretch in the back of the calf. Um, we're feeling some moderate discomfort there. And then we start to contract the calf muscle. Um, people sometimes even cramp up. Um, and I'm actually fully okay with the cramp because this is a different type of cramp than say, you know, if you were severely deficient in electrolytes or, you know, mm -hmm. you wake up in the middle of the night and you have a cramp totally different uh, than the actual neurological cramp that you're getting here. So we always say that uh, don't fear the cramp. Um, that actually just, that's a signal that tells you that that's not a muscle that you're contracting in a certain range of motion often and it just tells you that's a muscle that you need to work on but um, even like a hamstring cramp yeah if you're doing a active stretch mm -hmm. uh okay. cramps okay but if you say you're and even yeah in, in this case say you're running and you get a cramp um you know not like a full say grade two tear or grade one tear um that's telling you that a it's pro probably your your hip and or ankle again you're when you get those cramps, sometimes, again, outside of uh, electrolyte uh, deficiency and or just dehydration, that's telling you that something's not right. That's like a check engine light. And um, that cramp will say, you know, so then you have to look at, all right, where am I tight? Why is my hamstring really overworking right now? It's doing more than it should. Uh, so usually it's a tight hip or a, a tight ankle. Um, but yeah, going back to that, uh, you know, the question, some discomfort perfectly okay in the muscle that you're stretching out. Uh, a cramp in this case, because we're doing active stretches, you'll get that sometimes. Um, and the more you stretch, th the good news is on that front, the more that you stretch and contract that muscle, the less you will cramp and eventually you won't cramp at all. That's, it's, it's kind of amazing um, because now your body is more resilient. It's, it's stronger in that end range of motion. 
Um, but if you get a pinching pain, if you get a like a sharp stabbing pain, if you get numbness and tingling, if you get burning, if you if your you know ankle or whatever you're stretching, your hip, your leg starts to fall asleep per se, we never want to push into that. That's that's a different thing. Um, mm. And so, say if we're doing the the ankle stretch in this case, you shouldn't feel a pinch in the front of your ankle because that's really not what we're stretching. And if you're feeling that, then that's usually what's called a, um, it's, it's ligament, it's a joint capsule tightness per se. And right. there's gonna be different stretches to target that joint capsule um, to get that working a little bit better um, than just say more of the basic stretch that we're talking about here. But um, yeah, you never wanna push into any burning, numbness, tingling, any of that. Um, you always want to either adjust your position um, or just get out of the position and and not hold the contraction of the stretch as long, or maybe that stretch just isn't right for you on that day. And I would like to do what you do um, is it should be foundational for us to incorporate flexibility or stretching into our active routine, right? So we need to, just like you said, brush your teeth, drink water, eat a healthy diet. We need to also um, move our bodies and add stretching into the mix. Yeah. 100, yep. 100%. And, you know, the, I guess the, the benchmark that I like to tell people and teach people is that, yeah, three times a week, if we can fit that in, I think that's totally doable. 10 to 15 minutes. I, I really understand, you know, people are busy with their jobs, with their kids, with their family. Um, but like, you know, we have people DMing us, sending us pictures, emailing all the time when they're doing movement vault with their kids. You know, you can always Aww. find, you, you know, with their dogs, kids, whatever it is, you can yeah. always find little chunks of time to get it in. Um, and so, you know, at a minimum, three times a week is really going to set you up for significantly decreasing your chances for pain and injury, significantly decreasing your chances for, uh, you know, a joint replacement when you're, you know, people are getting them early and earlier and earlier these days, but mm -hmm. uh, later in life. And, you know, it's a, it's a win-win because when your joints are moving better, then you're actually performing better as well. So you're performing Inc better and yeah, in the gym, in life, everything. Yeah. Increasing your quality of life. Absolutely. 100%. Yep. So Dr. Grayson, you've been fantastic. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is really <laughs> eye-opening in a lot of different ways. So I definitely want to give you another chance to just kind of dive into all your social media handles, yes. obviously your app, your website, any way that we could keep up with what you're doing, get all this great information for us to utilize. Yeah, I really appreciate it. You know, my real goal is to, you know, kind of like we talked about in the beginning, is just to just educate people in the importance of, again, stretching and the importance of actually uh, performing effective stretches because, you know, it's all about working smarter, not harder, right? So if we're essentially doing the same old stretches that we learned in middle school and high school and all these things, you know, unfortunately, we're not getting those results. So uh, it's that two prong approach like, okay, we need to start stretching because all the things we just talked about. And then if we are going to stretch, let's make sure we're doing effective um, you know, uh, routines and stretches. So yeah, people can check us out. It's uh, movement vault. Again, it's the word movement via ult.com. Uh, in the app store, you can search for movement vault as well. And then really all the uh, social media platforms, uh, it's just at movement vault. And, um, if they want to see me, uh, doing some of my, uh, my health stuff, I'm, uh, at Dr. Grayson Wickham on, uh, Instagram. So yeah. And you're on Twitter. Yep, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and yeah, all the all <laughs> all the things. We're trying to really put some yeah. good uh, information, and and really, my my driving light is to um, just help people. You know, move better, feel better, and the quality of life that that is gained and improve when someone's no longer dealing with that three or four out of ten back pain or knee pain, or doesn't have to get that knee surgery, or is able to you know, play with their kids without back pain. We get some amazing stories and it, it just fills my heart from, you know, the movement fault users mm -hmm. all over the world. Um, or somebody can, you know, bench press without shoulder pain or whatever your goals with are. Um, that's really my driving mission. And it's, it's just amazing to be able to help people in that way. Well, thank you. We're honored to have you here today. So appreciate all of your golden information. 
<laughs> it was so awesome. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Thank Have you. a great rest of the day. Take care. Was- See ya. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of This Podcast Burns Fat. We're so excited to have you as a listener, and we're hoping that you've really enjoyed the content as well. And if you did, please run over to iTunes and provide a rating and or review. It will go a long way in helping us continuously build our listenership up so that we could provide you with excellent content regarding fat loss, weight management, and just an overall healthy lifestyle. Thanks so much. Have a great night.